I'm Austin. I'm just going to dive right in here. And as usual, my favorite part of this kind of thing is in the discussion afterward. And I kind of see my job as, as hopefully posing provocative or interesting questions or ideas that we can hash out in Q&A. So I'm going to kind of blitz through things. And at some point, I'll probably play a few seconds of something and say, OK, moving on. Uh, so if for some reason I cut off something that is of use uh, to you or valuable, please just scream at me and uh, tell me to pause there because the whole point of doing any of this is to share something that is hopefully meaningful and worth hearing. And if I am circumventing that, then I'm literally defeating my entire purpose on standing up here. So with that said, um, last summer we shipped the third of a franchise that I had worked on for uh, over six years called The Banner Saga, that is a wonderful kind of case study for uh, the success of, of an indie, a little fledgling indie that could. Uh, they're, they're one of the sort of uh, flagship Kickstarter games that I can't overstate the, the privilege and, and joy of, of having worked on. Out of curiosity, who here's played those games? Oh, awesome. Well, now I know it's like where the intersection of Turn-based strategy and willing to wake up and be at a 9 a.m. talk exists. <laughs> Probably the entirety of that demographic is in this room. But uh, so, okay, good. Well, I, I, there's a, I, I didn't want to spend too much time on the basics of the game since we're here to talk about the music. And especially, I want to get into kind of the, 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 the meta story or the peripheral story around the score itself and make it about how we were able to do the things that we were able, as opposed to purely just kind of having a musical nerdiness about themes and that sort of thing. But we will do a taste of that. Um, so yes, it all started as a Kickstarter. It was three guys from, ba from Bioware who had basically gotten fed up with 10 years of, of uh, working on the Old Republic and said, we, we want to make our own thing. And they quit their job and put this game on Kickstarter and had the very lucky timing of putting it on Kickstarter right when that sort of 2012 magical gold rush happened. They had already prepared the campaign to hit the green light when Double Fine announced their Kickstarter and sort of triggered an explosion of interest. And so they were already queued up, ready to go, and just hit the button. And then, you know, within 24 hours, they were 300% funding or something like that. And they were one of those kinds of stories. Um, and this was back in those, you know, naive, wonderful, innocent days of 2012 when no one realized that there's like a 50-50 chance that you'll give them all this money and they'll actually make the game. And so there was a lot of love and excitement going into it. And, and I was brought in in the middle of their campaign. They called me and said, can we show you our game? And are you interested? And, and uh, I was blown away immediately. For those of you who aren't familiar, you know, this art style of the game is one of the things that immediately kind of announces itself to people. And I just thought, this is, this is just too uh, fantastic. So, uh, so off we went. So... Uh, an actual post-mortem, and um, I'm just going to quickly give you some, some rundown of the, of the score and the creative choices that were made, uh, and then, but I really want to focus on this kind of second point here of the logistical analysis and how we were able to pragmatically achieve what we were, you know, the title of this talk is how to make indie sound AAA, and it was really, it was, it was, it was not easy, but at the same time, it sort of was easy, and that's why I'm excited to talk about it. And the big takeaway that I'm just going to repeat over and over and over is about embracing your constraints, is about finding those things that appear to be a limiting factor and turning them into an enabler of ideas and of creativity, and, um, and letting the, the specifics of that situation dictate your creative vocabulary so that it becomes itself. It becomes the thing that it could have only been made under these circumstances, because ultimately that's, I think, the... the the thing we're all chasing, especially you know, as composers at least, as artists in general, trying to make something that sort of is this magical distillation of, of truth in that moment. And so uh, that's only achieved, I think, by um, embracing these constraints. So I'm, I'm also going to kind of skip around a little bit amongst the three games and not do kind of a chronological retailing of the, retelling of the trilogy. Um, so to start, the most obvious thing about this is that it's music written for a wind ensemble. This is a photo from our recording session of the first game. And so the first thing that's obvious is this is not a recording studio that we did this in. Uh, this was the Meyerson Symphony Center in Dallas, Texas, 
Um, and that ensemble is the Dallas Winds. Uh, at the time, they were called the Dallas Wind Symphony, and then they decided they were sick of getting confused with the Dallas Symphony. And so now they're the Dallas Winds. And, uh, and just for my fellow nerds, I thought I'd throw in there what the uh, instrumentation was on those first sessions. And so, a quick story on how we got to this choice is I had, you know, a good solid t two years. I mean, of course, like all games, it was supposed to be, you know, we're going to make it nine months. And then six months in, it was like, well, okay, maybe a year. And then as a year starts to approach, okay, well, it's for sure going to be at least 18 months. And then at 18 months, it's like, okay, we're all about to be broke and homeless, so two years it's going to be, regardless of the state of the game. And... So I had a lot of time to think about it and mull it over. And something that happened that was very fortunate was as a way to play test their turn-based strategy mechanics, they created a free online multiplayer called Factions that was basically just simple 1v1 uh, uh, playing of, of the game and had no story or anything like that. It was just kind of a tournament mode. And so I played that like 150 hours or something like that because I would, I would be able to write music and then we'd bake it into the build and I could go on and play someone and see how that music reacts in an actual kind of live fire situation, you know, within an hour. And a lot of interesting things seemed to emerge. And one of them early on was the, the actual palette. You know, we, they had greenlit a really, um, because their Kickstarter was so successful, but the team was really small, um, they had said, you know, we're willing to, to carve out a pretty substantial amount of money for the score, but that's all kind of abstract and hypothetical until you know what kind of score you're going to write. So I just kind of said, well, you know, it's Viking lore, and it's about the end of the world, and, and so, you know, let's start toying around with something orchestral, but it's kind of generic to just assume it's going to be orchestra, but, you know, I'm a big believer that writing is in the rewriting, so let's just start somewhere, and if it's garbage, which it inevitably will be, we will start to modify it. And so I started writing music, and then at some point, I just kind of just took a step back and listened to it and realized, you know, I'm not really using the strings. They're sort of texturally like violins holding some high notes. It was all kind of brass chorales and things like that. And I then had this flash to, when I was in college at NYU, um, there was a world premiere at Carnegie Hall of John Corleano's third symphony called the Circus Maximus, which was commissioned, it was at the time, it was the largest, I think it still might be, the largest wind ensemble commission ever. It's like a 45-minute symphony, all you know, unbroken, continuous music for just the most unbelievably huge group. You know, I love that it's like a 70-piece group, but they don't have the 40 quiet ones in the form of the strings. So, you know, it's like 25 trumpets and 12 trombones and 10,000 tubas or whatever. I don't know. It's, it's, and it's all, it's very, it's very uh, surround sound. If any of you are familiar with the piece, you know, the musicians are scattered all throughout the hall. And there's, you know, a whole drum corps behind you. And it's a, it's a very immersive and crazy theatrical experience. And I was like 19 or something like that. And, and as a composition student, we were, we were comped tickets to go see this. And it, rewrote my DNA. It was the equivalent of Bruce Banner sitting there and getting the gamma radiation burst where just afterward I emerged, I came smashing my way out of Carnegie Hall, a fundamentally different composer, after this experience of hearing that piece. And because I was, you know, I was an orchestra kid and a general sort of like gamer nerd. I wasn't one of those band nerds who thought through this, this lens. So, uh, I had this flash of, of the power of, of, of a wind ensemble remembering that experience. And so I thought, you know, well, I could try to just do a session orchestra of wind ensemble, but I thought, what if I called the conductor of that piece that I was at Carnegie Hall? Why not? Just see where that conversation goes. And he's like the foremost conductor for wind ensemble music named Jerry Junkin, who teaches at University of Texas, Austin, and he also conducts one of the foremost, if not the premier wind ensemble that's professional in the US, because that's kind of a niche market, right? Like I say, the premier wind ensemble, and it's like on a list of one. Um, but uh, still, we'll give him to him. Uh, uh, he, he's a phenomenal conductor, and he's, as is normal in the wind ensemble world, he's always commissioning composers and things like that, because that world craves new music in stark contrast to the orchestra, which is like, we like to cut things off around Mahler. Uh, and uh, so, I just reached out to him and I said, you know, I'm working on a game and you kind of changed my life with your Circus Maximus uh, commission and performance at Carnegie Hall a number of years ago. And I am curious if there's an opportunity to work together. I didn't know if he would even write back to my email. And he writes back like five minutes later and says, let's jump on the phone. This sounds super interesting. 
And so it turned out that it was one of these pipe dreams of the ensemble. They've released multiple albums, including Grammy-nominated or winning albums in the kind of classical categories. And, uh, but the idea of recording a score was one of those sort of pipe dreams that they never anticipated could possibly be reality, but just they thought would be so cool. Um, and so it very quickly led to a conversation of, well, let's make this reality. So um, obviously there's not an abundance of scoring stages in Dallas, turns out, and they, all their albums that they've done uh, have been in this, this hall, the Meyerson Center. And so it was like, well, what would it take to record there? Well, it turns out it's so not easy uh, because this is a concert hall. And this is a classic example where I'm just kind of letting one conversation lead to the next, to the next, to the next, and creating all kinds of challenges, but saying something will novel and interesting is going to emerge out of this, or at least that's the hope, as I kind of, it's like Dr. Strangelove writing the nuke down, just going, ah, I'm sure this is going to be fine. And, um, and so one thing I'm going to get to that is going to come up a lot was that standard practice in a recording session situation, obviously, is everyone's wearing headphones and playing to a click. And they were like, click? What is this concept? And it was like, well, you know, to be able to, you know, have a real strong consistency uh, of duration, especially if there's prelays involved, you know, if I have any kind of electronics or otherwise, uh, or multi-layering, or if we need to stripe it because we're breaking it apart into, into layered, you know, brass separate from percussion for implementation purposes or anything like that. And they were like, hmm, let me get back to you. And then I start getting these emails about, oh, we found this really cool, you know, wireless low wattage radio transmitter system, and we can get a bunch of wireless headphones for the orchestra. And I was immediately like, yeah, this is, a, this is, this is I'm watching two trains in slow motion heading towards each other. So I said, Tell you what, I'm going to do this entire score that, and not require a click. That's the only way we're going to get to the finish line here. And so that, that single decision ended up being the foundation for a lot of unusual things that came out of it because the constraint was how can I record an ensemble uh, and, and do an effective game score where there's no exact precise consistency between even subsequent takes. Of a, of a given cue, and that, 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 as much as that closed certain doors, it opened up whole doors that never even considered because it's always the default position to just assume you're going to record certain ways. So here's just a little taste of how that sounded. That was easy. Uh, so another thing I decided to really own is that it's the very opposite of a typical studio recording. Normally, I'm a big fan of making recordings immersive, where you're, you're deliberately kind of placing the listener inside the ensemble, where you're giving them a hyper-real perspective that's not actually physically reproducible acoustically, where you're getting all the detail of a barrage of microphones inside the orchestra, and also your surrounds and your decadry and all that kind of thing. Um, but in this case, we didn't really have that option. Um, so it's like, I'm going to own the liveness of it. I want to work in a concert hall. Let's kind of make that part of the core. So it's very much about the ensemble sense, which is the opposite of how I normally work. But it, it led to certain aesthetic considerations. So that's anyway, that's a little taste from the very first game. Uh, another thing I'll just mention is aesthetically about the game itself, there's a, a mournfulness to it that I said, I really want this to be uh, very heavy emotionally, but not loud. I'm not really expecting a loud score. I, it should be about warriors who are begrudging the fact that they have to go into battle and they're weary and they're tired. You know, one of the story points is that the sun, one of the kind of symbols that the apocalypse has begun is that the sun has come to a complete stop in the sky and they're just eternally in this kind of noon daylight. And everyone's just getting worn totally ragged by the fact that there's never night, there's never rest. And so the notion that these are powerful warriors, Viking-inspired kind of Norse, but they're not bloodlusting. Every time they pick up their sword, it's with this massive sigh and resignation. And, and I thought, you know, 50 musicians playing loud instruments, you know, like we had multiple timpani, you can kind of see in the back corner, you know, we had a timpani section where I'd write a note and it would, two timpanists would play that note, that kind of thing. You get a big body of sound even if it's playing a pianissimo and it just made everything feel really heavy. Um, I'm discovering a flaw in how I set this up where it's going to try to replay my audio. Um, skipping to the second and third games, uh, we stuck with this formula 
the second one, we migrated to Colorado. There's, there's whole stories about how we chose where and all that kind of thing. I'm not going to get into that because it's, you know, it's not really what I'm after here today. Very similar, but not quite identical instrumentation. And you'll notice also, just for what it's worth, for those who are band nerds, we, we eschewed some of the normal uh, wind ensemble traditions. For example, the clarinets tend to be the violins of the wind ensemble. So a typical standard concert band would ha have like 20 clarinets, and so everything just sounds like Sousa marches to me, and I, I hate that. And so I was like, we're gonna have a normal number of clarinets, and I'm sorry to your 20 clarinets that aren't gonna get the call uh, and have to stay home, but uh, it needs to sound more orchestral and less, less Sousa-y. Um, but kept the saxophones, because I thought, you know, everyone underrates how nasty a sax can get. We, it, you know, it doesn't have to play uh, jazz, and it doesn't have to be, you know, an oompa. It doesn't have to be a lot of the things that it has sort of a stereotypical reputation for. Um, and, uh, and especially for the second game, where the overall aesthetic got way darker. Um, so here's a taste of that. Um, the, the bombast kind of notched up a little bit as well. polyrhythms, which is super fun. Orchestras tend to revolt. Uh, the third score uh, was done in London at AIR. This was the only one that was done uh, in a more traditional scoring sort of way, but, but the reason I chose AIR over Abbey Road was because AIR is kind of like a big hall. It's basically a converted church, and if you raise the ceiling all the way up and you kind of make it as live as possible. It has very similar acoustics. And, and also the third one, we had a shorter schedule and a tighter budget. And so I actually had to record the entirety of the orchestra, orchestral parts of the score, which was about an hour and 10 minutes of music in a single very fast moving day. Um, and they can do that in London because they're not human. And uh, <laughs> so um, here's a taste of that. <laughs> Is that loud enough? I feel like it should be like uncomfortably loud. Yeah, can we are you able to raise it? I tried The third one is also weirder, as you can hear. Um, so anyway, it gives you a sense. So one of the things that ended up being un unexpected and unintended is that there's a kind of uh, slight difference in the sound of each one because they were all recorded in different cities, different musicians. There was not a hell of a lot of continuity musician-wise, with the exception of um, there's also a, a bunch of soloists. And the three that form the kind of heart and soul of it are these, these YouTube stars. Um, and part of the reason for that was that having come from Kickstarter, I thought this is a game birthed by the internet. This is a game that would never have existed without the kind of communal love of 20,000 initial Kickstarter backers who gave it close to a million dollars. And so how, how better to kind of place at the heart and soul of it, surrounded by the bombast and the heaviness of the wind ensemble, is you know, some singers and a single violin, the one exception to the no strings policy. Um, uh, would be people whose career is also born of the internet. You know, the whole notion of a YouTube star is so beautifully 21st century that, like Peter Hollins, as an example, who 
lives in Eugene, Oregon, and has approaching 400 million views on his content, 90% of which he makes in his living room. Um, and he's just this spectacular singer. And around the time of this, he had done a cover of the dwarf song, The Misty Mountains, from the uh, Hobbit film that I saw and was like, I need this guy in my life. This is fucking beautiful. And, um, and, there, are, and there are videos like this, you know, where he's doing the classic multi-track self-camera thing, and he's just an amazing vocal producer. Um, and then, like I said, Taylor, for the, um, for the one non-string exception, and I told her, I said, you're, you're going to probably feel uncomfortable, but I want this to be very rustic and raw and live, to, especially given the nature of how we're doing the wind ensemble. So do you have like a practice violin from when you were a kid that's just objectively not a good violin? That Can we use that? And can you like tune it and get it perfect? And then just sort of loose, just kind of randomly twiddle your tuning pegs, then we'll do it. And it was kind of like the, you're going to be the reason my career ends, isn't it? Uh, that's, the, that's the look I got. She did it. It's awesome. Uh, and then uh, Maluka, who uh, exploded onto YouTube uh, around that same time, she had done a cover of one of the Bard songs from Skyrim, and it's hilarious because she's, she's generally pretty shy and very, um, and very sweet, and uh, she didn't want to share this recording and her, her now husband which I guess shows that there's a happy end to this story. Spoiler. Uh, she was at work one day, and he put this video of her that she had made uh, online and then went on Reddit and was like, everyone check out this awesome cover I found or something like that, totally. So she came home from work discovering she was like a viral phenomenon and didn't have a chance to veto him because uh, it's just astoundingly beautiful. I was going to play you excerpts from all these, but I know I'm going to run out of time if I do. So go look up all of them if you're not already familiar. They're brilliant. Um, I also had a, quite a few additional uh, other solos, um, and um, uh, one of them that's cool is you can see this little instrument here that's called a, the, the, this, the non kristen image. Uh, oh, my mouse pointer doesn't show up over there. But the, the horn there is, is a, uh, it's called a buka horn, uh, and it's, a, it's one of the only kind of known Viking instruments, because there's not a lot known about Viking music. It's just one of those things that archaeologists have found instruments, but there's no uh, record of exactly what it sounded like. Obviously, there was no musical notation or anything like that. And obviously, also, this is not explicitly a Viking game. And even if it were, what's the point of trying to do Viking music? We want to make something that's a little bit more emotionally universal. Uh, but I am a fan of kind of coloring it and, and sprinkling it in. So it turns out the buka horn, it, there's basically one guy in the world that makes them, and it's effectively a lamb's horn. And it's like, if you want one, you have to order it a year in advance because he has to like raise the lamb and then do unspeakable things. So my friend Noah, who collect, he's a trombone player who collects uh, instruments, and, and he was like, I've always wanted to order one from this guy. And so I said, he said, how much time do you have on this game? And I said, I've got at least a year. And so he said, okay, I'll check back in with you later. And then one day he shows up with, with that thing, and it's hilarious because it's, it's horrible. It's basically just a, it's just a horn that's got holes drilled in it and a mouthpiece jammed on it, and it can play like six notes, and I love it, and it's on all three scores. And... Uh, <laughs> And so, um, uh, obviously, we tracked some percussion. Uh, Johan Sigurdsson was the voice actor from the game who, he just sounds like a Viking. And so, uh, he's just got this amazing, like, I have his original audition. He's this Icelandic guy who's like, my name is Johan, I'm reading for the Banner Sock. And it was like, yeah, I don't read the lines, just, just when can we see you Monday? And uh, so I said, I really want to write vocals for this guy. I hope to God he can't sing because uh, it's just going to be so gritty and awesome and delicious. And of course, he show up, and, and he picks up the part, and he's sight-reading sheet music. And I was like, what the hell? That's such bullshit. Uh, and, uh, but he, he, he was amazing. And just to compliment my, my, um, my YouTube uh, people, and especially because Peter Hollins is like the ultimate sort of like um, pure, pure acapella glee club kind of very pure specific. The idea of it being even one cent sharp is horrible to him. So I had to kind of pour salt all over that in the form of Johan. Um, and then uh, ever in, in search of interesting X factors, I have a, I have a friend who's a composer and, and, and a didgeridooist. And so I just had him come over to the studio and I said, I really want to make kind of all sorts of interesting weird sounds there. I played a little bit of accordion. Um, uh, on the second game specifically, you can see there's a, there was an Icelandic, uh, an, uh, by the time we finished the first game and it went really well, in the meantime, this video had gone viral of these guys in Iceland singing five-part a cappella in a train station, a, a hymn in, in Icelandic. And they're a band called Arstíðir that does music that 
to my ear, almost sounds like the band Kansas. It's sort of like this beautiful, lyrical, 60s ballad -y sort of thing, but mostly in Icelandic, and, and they all play strings and things, and they produce insanely well, and, and so I just cold called them, and I said, I saw your video, and you want to record on a game, and they're all just like, all right. It's so <laughs> insanely chill, and I was, okay, well, glad you're excited, and anyway, I'll see you in a few months. And uh, so wrote a bunch of stuff for them. In fact, the weird vocals that you heard that were all processed and strange in the last clip, that was from them. Um, and then on the third game, uh, added um, my friend Anthony in Los Angeles who had just bought, he, he, he's a bassoonist and he, he bought a bass ceruzaphone and sent me a photo of it because he knew that if he sent me a photo, I would say, I need to write for that. I don't know what it sounds like, but it looks like a steampunk bassoon. I mean, it's the weirdest thing. It's all these pipes and key switches, and, and it, it kind of sounds like a baritone saxophone. Uh, it's about a really aggressive, it's just ugly as sin, and uh, perfect. And, uh, and then I also worked with a wonderful singer from the Faroe Islands uh, named uh, Ivor. And then uh, another, uh, Kristen Nega. Is Kristen hiding in here somewhere? I will embarrass her extensively. She's new to avoid this talk. Um, <laughs> Kristen plays all the woodwinds. She, I had worked with her on Abzu. She's the featured oboist on that score. And, and, but she plays, so we, we created a cocktail. I sent her a line and I said, will you uh, record this melody on basically every instrument you have and send me all the stems? And then I want to kind of create a composite instrument from some subset of that and then that will be our template for the score. Because I wanted some new sound for the third game that has, had, had no precedent in the prior ones. So what we ended up with was this blend where the, it would be the melody on um, English horn and then an octave higher that on like an Irish penny whistle and I usually would put a huge amount of reverb and delay so the penny whistle sounded more like overtones of the English horn. You couldn't really hear it on its own. And then, um, and then uh, she had this thing called a zaffoon which is, looks like a garden hose that someone put a mouthpiece on and it's just the weirdest sound ever. I'm pretty sure she made that up, uh, and, but there was this nasally thing that would show up in the stems that was just fantastic, a good, a good partner for the bass ceruzaphone, uh, and, and I'm blanking on what the fourth one was, but we had this kind of little quartet that everything I sent her would get recorded, and then I had my sort of, I crafted a, a default setting for all four of them to, to live in. Um, and then the last thing that is just always way too fun to uh, not make a point of is uh, our friend Viking Jesus. Um, <laughs> who, uh, it's, it's actually coincidence that he would be Viking Jesus, but um, he is a, like a metal musician who I met through uh, the world of video games live, and Tommy Tallarico, and he had done a Journey cover of, a, a metal cover of Journey uh, called Burning Sand, and it was awesome, and so I was like, I want to I wanna work with him, I need him in my life, and so I wasn't quite sure how to do that, and I thought, what about prepared electric guitar? So I'm just going to, if you'll indulge, I'm going to just show you, um, we did a little kind of behind the scenes thing for you two, and I, it's better to just show So in tell. spring of 2012, so forgive he went to town, I said, bring me a giant toolkit of things that I could use. Then we decided, what if we went totally over the top and you literally sawed this thing in half as a sound? The sound of you literally cutting through this thing. And he did. And I love how he left all of his shit on the desk. So part of the recording is all the crap vibrating. So that all that crunk, crinkling, and that's all the guitar. I mean, he sent me a huge amount of stuff and I created a whole kind of effects library out of it. And then you'll see, it's, and there's Maluka, and there's the sawing. So that gives Banner Saga one came out. So that gives you um, a kind of a sense, and, and the reason I'm, I'm spending a fair bit of time talking about that is a point that I'm going to get to later and sort of spoiler now is the idea of embracing constraint. Our budget really was quite narrow 
And so I knew I couldn't write like two hours of orchestral music. There wasn't enough in the budget to record the orchestra for two hours. So you have all these variables that you could start sliding up and down. And so one of the choices was, well, I could do like a small orchestra for the full length of the score, or I can save that for the sort of most crucial moments and figure out ways to bridge the gaps with an, a, a other sounds. And the idea is always to make sure that the score doesn't feel like it's got this schizophrenic sort of square wave of production value, where from one moment it sounds great and it's big live ensemble, and then the next moment it's like, we, it's like sampled trombones or something. And so by crafting an aesthetic built around things like soloists and, and uh, 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 prepared electric guitar being sawed in half, um, the, uh, the score could have ways of distributing itself over a large amount of time where it just sounds like itself at any given moment. You know, it has intimate moments which are marked by just hearing this guitar craziness and a single voice. And you don't listen to that and think, wow, but where's the orchestra? Suddenly it just is organically the next cue. It just makes sense. And you have to build it that way from the, from the beginning. Uh, but it's a, it's a great way to make the resources just go all the way to the finish line. Um, and uh, so I wanted to get a, a little bit on kind of the nerdy subject um, because it was, this was a really lucky situation where they were planning to make a trilogy. Of course, it was all contingent on the first game doing well because the Kickstarter was sort of genuinely that. It was a kickstart of this franchise. We didn't know if it, would, if it was going to come off. But the thing that was so exciting was that they knew what they wanted this story to be from the beginning. So I had my very first meeting with them in the days after the Kickstarter ended where they said, okay, here's how game one is going to end. Here's what's going to happen in game number two, and here's what's going to happen in game number three. And I was able to kind of plant seeds melodically and thematically from the beginning that I knew weren't going to be paying off for five years or something like that if, you know, sort of God willing, as it were. So just to give you a little sense of of that, um, here's how the main theme was treated at the beginning of the first game. Purely the horns and then the rest of the brass, um, which I don't know how readable that is, but it gives you a sense. It's, like I said, I was very drawn to this kind of brass chorale vibe. time the second game comes along. Same theme, but, you know, shit's worse. is it gets even worse. Uh, so third game, we, I started, it took me a while to figure out what to do here. Um, so I start off with the recording of the first game and then I kind of send it down the drain. So right now you're hearing purely relays effectively. And then here's my little quartet of Kristen layers. weird hybrid composite wind instrument. And in the interest of time, this one, of course, just gets even uglier. So what was so cool is I, I, I was able to think about this stuff for like five or six years, which which is very lucky, but that's but that's you know not that uncommon for the for the indie world, which is um, which is useful because uh, it lets me have think about how to 
optimize it to just be as grand and lush and, and itself as possible. Um, and then so, so jumping off of that, big spoiler, uh, the thing that was so interesting to me was that this story that was purporting itself or, or representing itself as kind of like a Viking apocalypse, you know, Ragnarok kind of thing. It, it, by the time you get to the end of the third game, you realize it's actually kind of like this Romeo and Juliet condemned love story. And, there, and you had almost no indication of that in the first game, and then little teases of it in the second, and then finally that's sort of an operating factor in the third game. And so I thought, well, what if the main theme, this sort of statement of, of brawniness and uh, regal nobility and all of that, what if that's actually the foundation of this thematic evolution that by the end has to become this other thing? And so I, I knew I would have almost no use for this within the context of the first game, but but thought, I'll, I will, I have to write a theme that I know can go there eventually. So, you obviously just heard the main theme, you know, very simple little bum, 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 bum. So the first time you really in earnest hear what I'm going to do with it is in the second, um, in the end credits. Here's a variation on that melody that Maluka sings. It's a little different though. So then by the time the second game comes along, there's two characters that are, you know, essentially pretending to not really know each other that well, in a way, and later it turns out, like, their kind of secret love is what's essentially causing the apocalypse. Typical. And uh, so, um, so here, so like, there's a scene where they're fighting, and I was like, let's use that. And then so by the time of the third game, you have, um, you know, that's just all the cards end up on the table and you end up with this, uh, this you know, r this, this thing that began very regal and noble and then has become very kind of um, full of love and then corrupted to all hell. Um, And then uh, by the time we reach the end credits of the third game, it all has to kind of come full circle. an ingredient that's going from one way, and there's, uh, this is happening in other places, but I'm skipping a lot of stuff. Um, another thing to talk about is that, uh, again, the intersection of where logistical and pragmatic constraints meet creativity and creative decision making is, is how we end up making things just become what they are and that optimize the situation. So again, embracing the constraints. I'm going to say it many more times. Um, and the fact that the score became so broadly aleatoric is, um, is part of this because I mentioned before I couldn't record with clicks, which meant that every time uh, there was a, a kind of a layering system where energy level is getting more crazy in the middle of combat, I didn't have a good way to pivot amongst these layers because I knew they wouldn't actually be able to loop and sync and crossfade and do the traditional things that we would do. And so it became like, well, what if I just created, I just did after we recorded the main cues, I took 20 minutes and recorded a whole library of custom sort of aleatoric clouds and effects that I could use to smear these very imprecise transitions from one performance and one take to another. Uh, and then it just became like, well, I think just aleatory can be kind of a, uh, uh, um, uh, an aesthetic mainstay of the score itself. In fact, I remember someone on Twitter wrote something like, it's as if um, 
how do they phrase it? It was like, it was as if the Lord of the Rings had a baby with the Matrix or something like that, uh, uh, which was awesome. Uh, and so uh, to give you an example of an extreme, um, in this cue, um, you can hear how it all flies together. This uh, here is what you're about to hear. So like the trumpets, for example, this gesture. Winds. Hey, there's that melody again. So yeah, you can also see that by the end of by the third game, I'd also kind of abandoned the idea of it's quiet and somber and it's heavy without being loud. It's like, ah, fuck that, fortissimo. Uh, and so uh, just a quick uh, just a notion of how we implemented it. I, I already just kind of touched on that. But because we couldn't do traditional sort of stacked stems and layerings and the kind of things that we would typically do in a game like this, uh, I had to come up with another system. But then also, the gameplay itself really informed what to do here because I, I play tested the game, as I mentioned earlier, quite extensively. And one of the things that I realized is that, especially the combat, where most of this discussion is taking place, uh, happens in a very slow way. It's not, it's not a real-time thing. It's turn-based strategy, and it very much moves. It's un unlike, say, XCOM, which is, turn in my opinion, XCOM is basically turn-based strategy, the new one, um, the new re reboot recently, the last few years. Um, it's essentially turn-based strategy trying to convince you that it's real-time because, you know, it's like the score is super turbocharged and the animations have really quick... Uh, cycles and, and it's trying to be as, you know, sort of Starcrafty or whatever as possible uh, in my estimation. And, and Banner Saga said, no, let's go for something more methodical. So this is sort of what it looks like to play combat in the game. No. Yeah, okay, click that. Like, it's not an exciting thing to watch. Probably not good for Twitch streaming. And, um, and so I realized that if the music is overly agitated and overly crazy, it's really going against the sort of inward and introspective uh, thing that you're experiencing. And then also, it's all very algorithmic, and, and, and very specifically, it's arithmetic. There's very simple, you know, five plus four sort of math underneath the hood driving the in-game stats, which is what we hooked all the music to. I'm not going to get crazy into that right now, but the bottom line is that we were able to track using very simple metrics if the player is effectively winning or losing at any given moment and wrap the implementation around that. Well, the thing is, if someone spends five minutes trying to make a decision about their next move and they click it and the system instantly knows, even before the animation fully plays itself out, if they are now losing or winning, and if that was sort of a good decision. So if the music immediately gives feedback on that, it's actually extremely distracting because you spend all this time and then decide, okay, you know what, I'm going to rotate this here. And if the system immediately is like, ah, oh, you done fuck up, you're sitting there like, well, shit, I, I, it's, you, need, you need it to unfold more gradually so that it's an emergent sort of gut feeling. And so I realized uh, we should very rarely ever... Uh, pivot in the middle of the sort of cycle of the loop. It, so think of it more like a train turnstile where you make your decision and downstream the track clicks to the left or to the right depending on, on where it's going to go next, but the loop had to play itself entirely out. Um, and so the reason I brought up the lack of click track so many times is it led to a thing like this. So I would create multi-layered cues, but we would have to record different performances of it, not just stack. So here's a combat cue from the end of the first game where it's built very much around the bassoons. Because, you know, when am I ever going to get to do that again? So that, you heard, like, I kind of was talking over it, but you get this, this, uh, behave yourself. Uh, it's kind of understated. Right? Okay, so then layer two, I had the charts marked, you can kind of see, it says layer two on the conductor score. So I would tell the musicians, if it says layer two, don't play this next take. We're doing layer one. And so they would just sit there. And then come do layer two, and now, you know, the trumpets become... It's trying to get ahead of me. The trumpets become the dominant chattering voice. But you'll notice the bassoons are still there. It's not a stem. They're just playing a little more quietly now because they know they're not in charge. So I'm able to actually shape it musically, which was really cool.
And then, of course, that by the time you get to the third layer. You get the idea. So, um, it led to uh, it led to a lot of uh, that whole concept led to all kinds of choices that would never in a million years have made, um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip some some things because I really don't want to run out of time and I really don't want to run out of time for questions and I'm already flirting with both of those things rather dramatically. So I want to I want to pivot to the to the logistics side and do a real crash course. So I will I will open up the uh, the uh, the hood here uh, fairly transparently. Of course, I leave off specific numbers, but. Um, this is the budget on the first game that I had to work with. This my music budget, and you'll see I, sent, I spent solidly half the money on hiring the orchestra. And um, I pulled all kinds of favors on this. I parlayed all kinds of favors to make this happen because we were, like this said, this is an indie game financed on Kickstarter. You know, there are AAA games whose music budget dwarfs the entire budget of what this game had to offer. But they did give me a kind of disproportionate amount of their. I mean, I had a six-figure number to work with. Uh, which was very outsized relative to the proportion one would typically have. Uh, but here was the, the thing, as I realized, as much as they were offering, there wasn't enough to do a big, grandiose score, uh, unless I was willing to not get paid. And so I basically said, here's the gamble I'm going to make. I'm going to make an exclusively back-end deal with these guys, and we'll put everything that they have to offer into the production of the score. So that I'm taking the exact same risk that they are as developers. Because these guys put all of their savings for two years into making this project. They, they received zero money. They used none of the Kickstarter money to pay for their life expenses. And all three of these guys were you know, married, had families, children in school, all that kind of stuff. And they said, no, nah, we're all in. And I have this philosophical idea of not wanting to be living a different life from the people I'm collaborating with. And so I thought, well, if they pay me and I'm very comfortable and luxuriously off of their Kickstarter money, and they're all meanwhile saying, if this game fails, we have to like go flip burgers or something, because they, they, burned their, they burned their bridges in their previous job, and this was, they put all their eggs in this basket. So I said, I think the score should live in that same headspace. So it was like, okay, um, give me a profit participation, a revenue share on the game itself, and total control over the soundtrack album, and in exchange, every single dime, and as it turns out, more than that, because I just get overexcited and start putting my own money um, into the score, is going to go into making this thing sound as great as it possibly can. So, but the first one was still very tight situation, so I'm pulling all kinds of favors, which is why the orchestra so heavily dominates. By the time we get to the second one, uh, had a little bit more to work with, and also the first game did really, really well. And so uh, it emboldened this strategy. So I said, guys, same proposition. And so, but this time things were a little bit more balanced. You'll see the soloists are, you know, a sizable punch. Uh, Something I always am telling people, never, ever, ever under budget, this big yellow one at the bottom, music prep, the sheer amount of copying and, and part prep and librarian work, never, never under budget that. That's exactly how things go to hell on the scoring stage, especially on a thing like this where you're recording with non-traditional ensembles. You know, in London, they have an infrastructure, but Colorado Symphony and the Dallas Wind Symphony, you have to show up with your shit together really, really, really solidly or it will go to hell because no one there can help you. They are clueless and it's like, just sit down and play the notes and I have to handle everything else. Um, and uh, the third game in London, obviously, we were able to uh, do things. This is a little bit more of a traditional makeup, but it was a similar kind of proportion. Um, and so it gives you sense. The entire thing was predicated on taking this risk with these guys. Now, I'm fully aware that not everyone is going to necessarily be in the same position to be able to do that. But and so, you know, you do you. Uh, no no, uh, no uh, coercion uh, meant or suggested and no... Um, uh, I'm not trying to say this is how it ought to be done. In fact, I'm sure there are composer colleagues of mine that would say what I did was sort of professionally irresponsible uh, because uh, it creates the precedent that I would effectively work for free, except that I would challenge that and say, I was not working for free at all. I damn well expected to get that profit participation, especially because I believed in the game. I thought they were making something really brilliant, and I said, I'm willing to take this ride with you, and in exchange, let's put the, you know, however many many tens of thousands that you're willing to, to spend on the score, I want all of that to be heard through the speakers because that's going to be how this game is, what you're doing the equivalent of in your art direction and in your game mechanics and all that. That's how to make it uh, come to life. And, you know, three for three games, it was, a, it was a wise decision. In fact, the first one did so well that if I had pocketed 100% of the money and done it all with samples, I would have made less. Um, and so, not the case with the other two, but you never, you never know... 
Uh, you never know what's going to happen with these things. And so they were razor thin margins. I had to pull a lot of favors on all three games. Uh, but, uh, but I think it was worth it because at the end of the day, I care more about having a final product that I'm really, really proud of. And so to give you an example of the kind of deal that was made is the, the orchestra in Dallas, they had a recording engineer they had a long history with and a record label that they, had rec that they had done albums with. And so I went to them and I said, look, I can't really afford to pay your engineer. I have no extra budget for your engineering crew. So how about this? If you front those costs, your label gets to release the soundtrack album and you will make 100% of the initial however much, whatever it takes to recoup your engineering costs plus interest. Then from that point, it's stair steps until eventually we're 50-50 partners. So that I'm incentivizing them to sell the hell out of this album and they're giving, they're uh, you know, joining in the risk with me. And they said, absolutely, let's, let's do it. And the really cool thing with that was that they do these super high fidelity surround sound albums and 192K ridiculous, ultra detailed uh, classical recordings. And so as part of their normal marketing, they sent it out to all these audiophile sites. And so to this day, I get Google alerts of the Banner Saga being reviewed on, on websites that know nothing about games, but they're like, really, they're saying, this album just sounds really great. And we're, we're reviewing, like, and, and uh, there's, there's one reviewer in particular that reviews speaker systems, and he always uses this album as his test. So it keeps showing up in reviews years and years later because of the nature of that deal that I made. And that's when it comes to this notion of how to make indie sound AAA, I'm always looking, if I'm on a project like this, always looking for what's every opportunity, who are the people involved, what talents do they bring, and how do we mutually incentivize each other to bring something to the table where we can all do really well. This is all based on the philosophical precept that everyone is willing to take on risk. And for some people, that's not possible. For some people, that's not interesting. They would rather just get paid. And so if, you, if that person has to be involved, uh, then you carve out you know, more money for them than, than the rest, and then everybody else gets to join in potentially a greater windfall later, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, the results, of course, let you uh, uh, create something that you couldn't just write checks and make it happen. It, it wouldn't, there's just not enough money. The resources, you know, on Banner Saga 3, for example, had to write close to two hours of score. And like I said, I had one day in the studio at Air. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be able to get about an hour and 10 music, which is an insane pace to do in a single day. But like I said, aforementioned, London musicians are not human. Um, and that time I was like, yeah, we're gonna use a click. Uh, we're gonna speed this process up uh, a, a bit. But I, but I uh, told them, you know, we're gonna make this very ensemble but we gotta move. And so, then it's like, how do I get another almost hour of music out of this? And that's how you bring all those other strategies of, well, if I just hear a singer alone, a cappella, for a minute, you can create a really evocative and interesting piece of music. And the, no player says, where's the orchestra? This is so cheap. Uh, like, that's, you don't have that problem. And so I was able to parse things out, which is a lesson I had, I had first uh, learned on Journey, really, so built around these cello solos with a very limited orchestral budget, but didn't really internalize till here. And so... Anyway, I know I'm moving very quickly and haphazardly, but I just wanted to share some of these things because I really, I was changed as a composer and person by working on this franchise. I, f I think that these guys uh, who made it are um, really, really, really amazing people and really amazing game developers, and it was a really privileged uh, experience to work with them. And uh, so that's why, for me, the big takeaway of diving in and meeting them at the same level of their risk and just saying, okay, screw it. No one here is getting paid unless it does well. Let's all just try to make something beautiful together. Uh, it ended up being one of the best experiences I've ever had. May, may, may never be taught, frankly. It was so creatively free and, and, uh, and wonderful and predicated on, on doing this. And, uh, but as a result, was able to make uh, indie sound, at least quasi, AAA. Uh, with that said, I have a few minutes to take any questions. Uh, I have less time than I would like, so if there's anything, I know we have a mic here, uh, and I'm happy to dive straight into it. And if you ask no questions, it means I have utterly failed to be provocative and say anything interesting, um, and I expect your reviews to reflect that fact. So, uh, all right, kicking it off. Hi, thanks. This was, this was great. Um, so for Banner Saga 3, did you say for that you did use a, a click? Uh, yeah. And just for sake of efficiency. And just random detail, I noticed that you had, what was it, fewer clarinets and more bassoons for that? <laughs> I, I, I think I'm it was, just curious to, like, if that yeah, was a creative decision. Or... I had to, well, every penny counted. So I had, to make, I had to make a few decisions where I limited very specific things just to kind of shrink where I could. You yeah. know, I had only one timpanist, for example, uh, that kind of thing. But it was, that was just 
like where can I make a cut that's you know in aggregate will show up and help, but won't really affect the overall sound, especially if I write conscientiously to avoid duplicating gestures. And so yeah, it was a couple, generally the same, but a couple little differences. Yeah, cool, thanks. Yeah, of course. Hi, thanks for the amazing talk. Um, I really like the bit about where you got all these weird instruments in. So I just wanted to ask, do you have ideas and then the instruments come in? Or do these instruments then dictate your ideas? And if that can ever be negative, just because you have this crazy horn, do you have to then use it? Yeah, right. You, you know? and it's a good question. Like, Because the, the, the corollary question that comes up a lot is, do you write to the strengths of your sample libraries, or do you uh, write, you know, trying to make the samples transcend themselves, knowing that the mock-up may suffer as a result. And I'm a big fan of, of not limiting. The tools are, are there truly as tools. Let your imagination be as unbridled as possible. But there's no question that if it's a super esoteric instrument, it will, it will do things better than other things. So if I just write for it in some abstract way, absent what it does best, I may not be using it to its most effective uh, capacity. Of course, I may also be missing the opportunity. I mean, think of... Think if Stravinsky had regarded the bassoon in only its uh, stereotypical way, we would never have had the opening of the Rite of Spring, which no one had ever heard a bassoon really play that high and, and gently and weirdly lyrically like that. And so it's, it's, it's sort of a tug of war between these two poles. In the specific case, for example, of the buka horn, the weird lamb's horn, the thing in literally, it, it only plays a kind of quasi-modal F-sharp minor that is not at all based around like an A440 derived... Uh, it's just kind of like, yeah, this is the closest note to F sharp that I would call that sound. Uh, and so, yes, I very quickly realized I have to write to what this thing can do, because I can, I, it, one note wrong, if I write a G natural, he'll go, I can't do it. Uh, you know, so uh, that uh, very much did dictate a lot of what I was doing in certain areas, uh, and then in others, you know. I did every once in a while say, I'm going to cheat and, and melodyne this thing to be what it needs to be. Uh, and re I'd record it, I'd write it, you know, half step off from where I wanted it and then just nudge it, that kind of thing. Thank you. Move it in its entirety so it's still all weird and out of tune, but it's just weird and out of tune in like G minor instead of F sharp minor. Um, so yeah, does that kind of answer your... Yeah, yeah. Right, thank cool. you, thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you. Did the conductor also not have a click? Uh, it, so it varied. On the first game, Basically, I, I split the conducting in half with, the, with Jerry, and I did all the rest of it myself on the second and third. Um, on the second one, I did have a click, but the musicians did not, and on the third one, everybody did. So it was kind of like every possible scenario of none, conductor only, everybody. Okay, and on the first one too, it, uh, no click? Yeah, not really. I mean, we, we did run a cable out to the booth, but half the time I would, and I'd just say, screw it. It's just too, I would rather be more present with the musicians and, and just do this that way. Own this environment, own this situation, instead of trying to be half in one world and half in another. Cool, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a question about budgets in general. Uh, how much do you feel like the audio budget should be uh, out of a total production budget for indie up to AAA, and does that percentage change? Indie up to trip. Good lord. <laughs> like this, like the start of hour two of my talk. No, like, uh, like what's the range? Like, would you go from ten percent for indie up to like thirty percent? I hear for... people. I my answer to that is always I'll take what you got uh, because frankly. I'm not making their game. I don't consider it my place to tell them how to spend their money because they have a thousand mouths to feed. And so, you know, on a game like this, for example, the art direction is extremely tedious to make. And so they're going to need, you know, a few support artists around the main guy working around the clock. It's just, and it's a game that the art style is why people end up noticing it. And so should, you know, sh theoretically, the art budget should dwarf the music budget because it's, it's why anyone's going to, care. And so those kinds of decisions are the things that they are grappling with. And I always say to them, you know, um, you, you know, I, I will, I will work within what you've got. I mean, that's kind of the main MO of the talk, right? Like if you tell me you only have a hundred dollars to produce the score and it's something that I feel like I have to be part of this, then it's like, okay, a hundred dollars, there's a lot you can do with a hundred dollars. Just got to figure out what it is. You know, immediately first thought is grab the zoom recorder and Start making weird sounds and do things that don't cost that much, you know, don't require a big orchestra, that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, to me, it's, there's no one size fits all. Every single production, it can even be literally like, you know, 
Far Cry 3 versus Far Cry 4 don't even have to be beholden to the same idea of how much the music budget should be. You know? So it's, it, even within you know, large-scale production, AAA, and one l sequel to the next, things can change dramatically. And I, I, I'm okay. I don't, I don't prescribe to them, like, you need to spend more money. The one thing that was unusual about this situation is on the first game, because of the Kickstarter, they, they brought me on halfway through. So I said to them, if we make music-specific rewards for the Kickstarter, can we funnel that money specifically to the score? So they had a baseline amount that they were basically willing to guarantee me. And then I offered things like, during the recording session, uh, you can get a signed part by a member of the orchestra who played. I didn't think anyone would care about that. It's like 100 bucks for you know, the third clarinetist's 4M25 page four. <laughs> um, and people, we made like thousands of dollars worth of selling though. It was actually, it took like a lot of, the musicians had to stay quite a bit after the session, <laughs> sitting there like, God damn. Um, actually, they, they thought it was really cool. Uh, and, um, and so that, we were able to funnel more money into the score based on that kind of arrangement because it was like, okay, well, you know, they basically said, we'll do it, now it's on you, go sell that. So like on Twitter begging, like, please support this. And it helped that Journey had come out like a month later. And, so there was a bit of a fervor going on. And uh, uh, so, yeah, anyway, that, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I don't, I don't believe in prescriptive budgeting. Thanks. All right. um, my name is Jasmine. I want to say thank you for this talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I found my what pleasure. you said about putting all the money into production very commendable because I'm kind of in a similar position now and I wanted to ask you were you in a position that allowed you to do that or you, did you have other projects going on at the time that enabled you to be able to funnel all of that music all of that funding into the music aspect of Banner Saga yeah absolutely yes I mean that it's a two-year period I, I definitely had other projects that I was doing that were an essential part of the ecosystem of why you, you end up kind of in a Ponzi scheme with yourself, mm -hmm. uh, sort of taking from here and giving it there. Uh, but, um, but you know, I don't think any of us got into this career with the idea being that it's all going to be very straightforward and easy and nine to five, Monday to Friday. Like I'm, I'm in it for the rough and tumble. And so the idea was, yeah, this is a super high risk. I'm turning down a lot of potential money uh, up front in exchange for something that hopefully is vastly more beautiful. Um, and far more fitting to the game. It, it, it's something that, it, it's like I feel professionally obligated to do this in a way because I, my goal is to make something that, that is as perfect as I can make it for that game in this context. And this path is the only way I can see to get there. So it's not even that I want to, it's I feel a certain obligation that I have to. And, but, yes, that completely and totally is predicated on having been gainfully employed in parallel to that. And that can be a balancing act because you obviously don't want to shortchange the amount of time that you're spending on this huge risk because then it's like you're, you're cutting your own idea off at the knees if you're so busy with other stuff that this project that you're taking this huge gamble on, uh, you don't have the time to actually really flesh out. So I, I was very lucky that I was able to survive and I was living okay, um, but able to spend enormous amounts of time. I mean, I, my Steam build of the game says I have like 300 hours of playing the game or something like that because I would just every single day try to figure out how to break, break it and, and make the music better and, and just learn more of the lore. And I'm like a huge fanboy for the game now. I'm like one of those Tolkien weirdos uh, about their thing where I'm like, oh, you know that part of the map where this, what is that all about? And they're like, just, just let it go, man. And uh, so, uh, uh, or they're probably at a point where like, we don't even know, just go start a fucking wiki yourself and, and put your own theories. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, anyway, I, I, yes, the, okay. the answer is, is for sure. I would, and that's why I say I'm not trying to prescribe this as this is how it must be done because I know I was in a very fortunate position to be able to do that. Um, but that's, that's how I was able to make indie sound AAA. You know, it was like I used all of everything on the table in my life in general to make that happen, including letting this project over here finance that project over there, that kind of thing, like my lifestyle during that project, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I think I'm out of time. So that was our grand finale question. Thank you all. <laughs>